On the morning of June 2, 2018, students at the Oregon Culinary Institute in Portland showed up for a day of classes, fully expecting to see their teacher, Daniel Brophy, already there. They naturally assumed that upon entering the building, they'd find him ready and waiting to get started with his traditional opening speech for the day, a speech that saw him jokingly warn students against whistling or grinning in the kitchen as smiling could sully the food. But while he was in the building when they arrived, he was in no condition to teach because, much to the shock of his class, he'd been shot twice and killed. There were no leads in the case. That was until it was discovered that Daniel's wife had written a blog post titled, How to Murder Your Husband. This is Monsters. Western Culinary, which was where I was, had a program where 101 was the first class you took and it was six weeks long and you were separated out from the rest of the uh, students. So when we joined the students, Dan had been hired at either that day or the day before. So it was like we all came together at the same place at the same time. Had you ever met a guy anything like Dan Brophy before you met him? No, no. He was unique. Can you tell us five things about him, maybe five things that separated him from the pack for you? He was smart. He was really smart. And he was funny. You could have to, I laughed all the time when I was with him, and a lot of people going, what did he say, what did he say, what did he say? Because he was very dry in his sense of humor. Um, he uh, he was kind. He, he was so kind. You, I was that probably won me over more than lots of other things might have. He not only thought outside the box. This man lived outside the box. He really did not operate going forward the way most of us did. But the thing I probably liked the best about him, the thing he loved me. And if that isn't a big I don't know, a big number one item, I don't know what is, you know, and I loved him back. To the outside observer, Daniel Brophy and Nancy Crampton Brophy had a picture-perfect life. Upon first meeting in the early 1990s, when Nancy had moved from her hometown of Wichita Falls, Texas, to his then home of Portland, Oregon, they'd instantly fell in love, with them getting married only a few years later. The couple had met in culinary school, and when Nancy graduated, they started a business together called Chef de Shore Catering. That business was founded in 1992, and by 1997, Nancy testified that the catering company was doing very well financially. She said that after 9-11 happened in 2001, though, their business took a hit as less people were having parties and gatherings. Eventually, they sold the business, and after working for a Thai restaurant for a little while, she took a job selling life insurance, and Dan started working as a teacher at the Oregon Culinary Institute. Another thing that Nancy started doing to try and bring in some extra income was to start writing and self-publishing suspense and romance novels. As far as those who knew them were concerned, they were the couple they all aspired to be more like, a couple whose love hadn't dimmed at all in the decades they'd been together. Behind closed doors, however, things weren't as rosy as they seemed as the pair often found themselves arguing over their growing financial problems. While Daniel, someone who'd grown up in Valley City, North Dakota, was earning a good living at the Institute, it wasn't enough to offset the fact that his wife just wasn't making a living off of her income streams. It seemed that the cost of self-publishing her books instead of going through the traditional publisher route had meant she was likely losing money especially as they weren't exactly big sellers at the best of times. That was particularly difficult for her to deal with because, while her husband was content to live a simple life at their home in a quiet town on the outskirts of Portland where he could tend to his vegetable garden, Nancy wanted more out of life. She wanted all the extravagance and high living she had hoped would come with being a successful author. 
a life that allowed her to go see the world and experience everything it had to offer. Sure, it wasn't like the pair were completely broke and unable to go away on vacations at all. In fact, at the time of Daniel's death, they had allegedly been planning a summer vacation to Mount Rushmore. But that was only the tip of the iceberg as far as what Nancy felt she deserved. And at least initially, she appeared to vent her frustration over her inability to create that life for herself in her fiction. With one particular novel where she detailed a woman killing someone in a fit of rage and then attempting to cover it up and another book titled The Wrong Husband, centering on a woman who tries to escape an abusive husband by hiding herself away in an exotic locale in Spain. Of course, if that latter book makes it sound like Daniel was an abusive husband himself, then that would be inaccurate. In reality, there's been no indication that that was the case. That said, fantasy or not, making a villain of him in her writing appears to have given Nancy a way to channel her own self-resentment outward away from herself. Sure, she continued to love him dearly, even if her novels might have suggested otherwise. How couldn't she? After all, he was the man who she once described on her website as being someone who made her hors d'oeuvres while she was taking a bath. But as time went on and their financial situation became more and more desperate from her point of view, her frustrations with Daniel grew greater and greater. And it seemed these frustrations were ultimately allowed to reach a point so critical that, even if she still cared for him, she'd eventually come up with a dramatic plan that she felt would allow her to finally turn her life around at his expense. It seemed that she had decided that if her books weren't going to afford her the lifestyle she wanted, then she was going to have to get that money via other means. And one of those other means was through life insurance policies. As it turned out, her husband had taken numerous policies out in his name a few years prior which were by then worth almost one and a half million dollars in the event of his death. A death Nancy was now thinking about how to best bring about. Of course, it's impossible to say when the idea went from being a fleeting thought to something she was outright intending to carry out, but it is known that at least as far back as 2011, she was mulling it over in her mind as that's when she wrote the blog post on her website entitled How to Murder Your Husband. What was in that blog post? Well, it involved her detailing how she, someone who had spent much of her time writing murder plots in her suspense novels, would go about killing someone in real life, namely her own partner. In that 700-word long post, she considered not only various methods of killing, but also the best way to hide the evidence of her involvement and even what motives the police might be looking for when trying to solve the case. At one point, she actually callously stated, quote, If the murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend time in jail. And let me say clearly for the record, I don't like jumpsuits and orange is not my color. Then, at another point, she chillingly added, quote, I find it is easier to wish people dead than to actually kill them. But the thing I know about murder is that every one of us has it in him or herself when pushed far enough. That wasn't the only time she would allude to murdering her husband either, as in an interview for the online blog Romancing the Genres in 2012, she explained her reason for writing so many romance and suspense novels as being because, in her own words, quote, Murder, mayhem, and gore seem to come naturally to me, which means my husband has learned to sleep with one eye open. At the time, though, no one who read either of those posts took it seriously as being the thoughts of a woman who was legitimately considering killing someone. No, with the former in particular, it was seen as nothing more than a harmless thought experiment, a bit of fun from someone who spent their days creating such scenarios for their fictional characters. Over the seven years that followed, however, things evidently went from being a thought experiment to a serious consideration as Nancy was by that point no longer prepared to live a life of relative financial hardship, something that was seemingly destined to remain the case for her as long as Daniel was alive. So, during the first half of 2018, she began making plans to turn these thoughts into reality and commit what she felt would be the perfect murder. And that perfect murder involved first going online and purchasing a ghost gun kit. A kit that allows someone to build their own unregulated firearm without the need for a background check. 
At some point in that process, however, it appears that she decided such a weapon wasn't going to be right for the job, so instead she attended a Portland Gun Expo and there she bought a Glock 17 handgun instead. With her later purchasing an additional slide and barrel that could be fitted to that weapon in order to modify it. With that done, she was free to move to the next step of her plan, the actual murder itself. Something she eventually decided should be carried out on June 2, 2018. That was the day that she waited until her husband had left for work in the morning, and then she quietly followed him to the Oregon Culinary Institute, where he had been employed for 12 years by that point. Once he was there and had begun preparations for the day by filling up ice and water buckets for his students from the sink at the back of the kitchen, she snuck up behind him and shot him once in the back of the head. Not wanting to take any chances, Nancy fired one further shot into Daniel's chest at close range. That shot ensured that Daniel had no hopes of survival as it penetrated his spine and pierced his heart. Obviously, at that point she would flee the scene and soon thereafter, at around 8.30 a.m., the students showed up and were shocked to discover the body of their teacher lying there on the kitchen floor, barely clinging to life. Immediately, they called the authorities and reported what had happened, with that leading to both police officers and paramedics arriving on the scene as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, though, the latter group were unable to revive Daniel as his injuries were far too severe. In fact, he died quickly after they got to the building. And to make matters worse, as the school had no security cameras, there was nothing to indicate who might have been responsible for what had evidently been a murder. All they could state was that it didn't appear to be a robbery as his wallet, car keys, and cell phone were still in his pocket and his 2010 Toyota Tacoma was still parked in the front of the building. And that meant, when they called Nancy to inform her of the bad news, they couldn't give her any ideas as to what might have happened. Of course, unbeknownst to them at the time though, she knew all too well what had taken place that morning as she was the one responsible for the killing. That said, she couldn't admit that, so instead she got in her car and raced back down to her now deceased husband's place of work where police on the scene consoled her and tried to explain as much as they could. But they weren't the only ones consoling her, as many of the students who were still there offered their condolences as well, even if they were still trying to process the shock of what they'd just seen themselves. To them, Daniel wasn't just any teacher after all. No, the man who had been 63 years old at the time of his death was more of a mentor, someone who tried to make the often brutal experience of learning how to become a chef fun by doing things like wearing comedic outfits to work in order to ease the tension for his class. According to one student named Travis Richards, quote, He had a closet full of different hats and jackets and wacky cow outfits that you would Velcro the parts of the cow onto. He was just that guy that you showed up to his class, kind of never knowing what to expect. He was always a guy to keep you on your toes. It wasn't just the kind way he treated his students that made them love him either. No, it was also the way he treated others in the community, such as when he would have everyone in his class take part in a big bake-off each Thanksgiving and would personally go and deliver all the pies they made to locals in the area. On top of that, he was also known as someone who anyone could go to if they had a problem and needed help in any way as he was, in the words of his faculty biography, the resident encyclopedia of knowledge for the Institute particularly when it came to mushrooms, his culinary passion and field of specialty. He loved mushrooms so much, in fact, he'd often take his students out to a nearby forest to forage for them during class. And when he wasn't doing that, he was accompanying them to the ocean where they could dig for clams that could be used in future recipes. Everything was about the love of creating the perfect dish for Daniel Brophy, something he wanted to impair on everyone he taught. But now that he was dead, it was beginning to dawn on all of his students that he'd never be able to teach them another thing again. But their pain was minute compared to Nancy's in their eyes. And as far as they were concerned, it was also just now beginning to sink in for her too, so she needed the support even more. Of course, they were only too happy to offer it to her, particularly because she was someone who had been such a regular fixture visiting him in his kitchen during the work days that many of them had even taken to lovingly nicknaming her the management. Unbeknownst to them, she had no need to grieve over his death, even if publicly she would put on a show that suggested she was suffering as the very next day she posted a tribute to her deceased husband of 27 years on Facebook, with the tribute stating, quote, 
For those of you who are close to me and feel this deserved a phone call, you are right. But I'm struggling to make sense of everything right now. While I appreciate all of your loving responses, I am overwhelmed. Please save phone calls for a few days until I can function. Needless to say then, those close to her gave her that time and allowed her to come to them whenever she was ready, something she began doing a few days later when she confided in some neighbors that she was considering moving out of their family home as Daniel's side of the bed was haunting her. As one neighbor who was later interviewed by People magazine, Heidi Hutchinson, put it, quote, The memory of him was upsetting her and she wanted to move pretty quickly. She wanted to get out of the house. Of course, the real reason she wanted to get out of the house, however, had nothing to do with it being too difficult to live amongst all the memories of her husband. No, Nancy had never felt it was a good enough home for her to meet her extravagant needs in the first place. But now, with her expecting to receive a massive windfall in the form of Daniel's numerous life insurance policies once everything had been worked out on that end, she could begin seeding the idea amongst others that this was her motive for leaving in order to get a bigger, more expensive house somewhere else. Following that, people started to move on. No one suspected Nancy would have had anything to do with her husband's murder. Why would they? After all, in the words of Travis Richards, quote, we knew that they loved each other very much, that she was his best friend. As the weeks and months went on, however, something began to change as investigators started to wonder if maybe she did actually have something to do with what had taken place on that fateful day. Why had they suddenly started to feel that way? Well, there was her infamous blog post for one, something that could at best be described as a dark coincidence and at worst an indication she had something to do with her husband's death. Of course, while her prior writings were certainly suspicious and were one of the initial things that caught the investigators' attention, that in itself wasn't reason enough to pursue Daniel Brophy's widow in connection with his death. No, the real eye-opener came when, three months after his passing, while following up on Nancy's story that she had been home when her husband was killed, they unearthed information that seemed to contradict that. It turned out that surveillance videos captured by traffic cameras at 7.08 a.m. that morning showed Nancy driving her Toyota minivan west on Jefferson Street, just a few minutes away from the Oregon Culinary Institute where Daniel worked. And given the fact that records in the building appeared to prove Daniel had disarmed the school's security system between 7.21 a.m. and 7.28 a.m., that would have given her a seven-minute window in which to get into the building without anyone being alerted. Obviously, then, the next question was to ask what she had been doing in that area on the day of the crime and why she had lied about being at home having a shower and walking her dogs instead. Was it possible that, as her prior blog post suggested, she really had hurt her husband? Those were some of the things on the mind of the investigation team now when they brought Nancy in for further questioning soon thereafter. And when her answer of being on a coffee run she must have forgotten about due to the stress of the whole situation didn't add up in their minds, they felt comfortable enough to seek a warrant that would allow them to search her home. Inside the home, they found evidence to suggest there was indeed more to the case than had first met the eyes. There they uncovered not only a Glock 17 pistol, which upon initial glance appeared to match the profile of the potential murder weapon, but also a ghost gun kit too. Once ballistic tests were carried out, the Glock didn't end up matching the murder weapon used to kill Daniel, nor did the ghost gun, but that didn't necessarily mean it hadn't been the weapon that had fired the fatal bullets. As investigators theorized at the time, Nancy could have swapped out the slide and barrel of her Glock in order to murder her husband and then reinstall the original ones after the fact so as to cover her tracks, though at the time they were unable to find the replacement parts that would have proved that theory. Still, even if there was nothing to show beyond any doubt that they now had the killer in their custody, the police still had enough evidence to formally charge her in connection to the crime on September 5, 2018. When news of that got out, it caused a massive shockwave to ripple throughout the local community as people were forced to contend with the fact that the woman they knew, someone who on the surface had been so in love with her husband, may have actually been the one to murder him in cold blood. For her part, though, Nancy would continue to deny that she had anything to do with the crime. Honestly, no one knew what to believe about the situation. 
Even Daniel's own mother, Karen Brophy, and Nancy's sister, Holly Crampton, seemed to be in denial when they first heard of the news. As they said when interviewed by ABC News soon after Nancy's arrest, quote, The family is just in shock. None of us believe it. It's craziness and it's just not true. Of course, there was good reason for them and everyone else to doubt her guilt at that point because, try as they might, police still hadn't been able to find that smoking gun that proved their suspect's guilt. Rather, all they had to go on at that moment in time were some educated assumptions based on the lies Nancy had told and the general location she was in at the time of the murder. What they really needed if they wanted to secure a conviction was solid evidence. Something that no public defender could deny. Something stronger than a blog post where a writer of suspense novels talked about killing someone close to her. And luckily for them, they soon found it in the form of Nancy's internet search history. In the end, it was something as simple as a quick look on her computer that led to the downfall of Nancy. And the man who was responsible for gathering the information that ultimately brought her down was Portland Bureau Officer Aaron Sparling, a digital investigator who at the time had over nine years' experience in his field. He's the one who was tasked with analyzing the Brophy household's computers to see if there was any digital evidence on them that might confirm or dismiss the investigator's belief that she was the killer. He didn't initially have any of the passwords that were needed to get into the three laptops which were found in the Brophy home. But with the help of a digital investigation platform developed by Magnet Forensics, it wasn't a problem for long and soon enough he was able to analyze everything Nancy had been looking up online in the months prior. Of course, such a tactic was an unusual one to take at the time as it was done out of desperation more than anything else. As he put it when later asked to describe the process, in fact, he stated, quote, This case wasn't built around photographs and text messages. It was built entirely around internet evidence. It's all search history. I can't recall a single other case in my tenure that was built off of internet-related evidence. But whether it was unusual or not, the tactic certainly paid off in the end, as by using keywords like handgun, gun, glock, and murder, Sparling was quickly able to retrace Nancy's steps back to November of 2017, the point when she'd begun planning out the crime she'd soon commit. It was in her search history for that period that he discovered searches for not only websites where she could purchase ghost gun kits, but also slides and barrels, with the latter result being particularly important as it seemed to strengthen the theory she had switched those out in order to evade detection. It was revealed that she had actually purchased a slide and barrel for her Glock 17 on eBay not long before the murder and now that very slide and barrel were nowhere to be found. Again, in the words of Officer Sparling himself when describing why that was a crucial piece of evidence to uncover, quote, It's not totally out of the norm to look up a Glock 17 purchase, but when you break it down to a barrel and slide, well, that's a little more interesting. Clearly then, that was exactly what the prosecution were looking for and it gave them hope that, come the time of the upcoming court case, they'd be able to convince the jury that Nancy was guilty. The combination of her internet search history, her blog postings, her location at the time of the crime, her purchase of a slide and barrel, and her prior lies about where she'd been seemed to confirm everything they'd been thinking for months. All they had left to do was prove it in a court of law. Those weren't the only pieces of evidence the prosecutors would be armed with when the trial began in the spring of 2022 as, while in custody during the years prior to that date, she appeared to accidentally confess to a cellmate about what she had done. As Andrea Jacobs, the woman who had been bunked up with the accused throughout that period later told authorities, One night, while they were alone in their cell, Nancy held her arms apart like a wingspan, then said that was how close to her husband she'd been when he was murdered. Of course, after realizing what she had just told Andrea, Nancy appeared embarrassed and immediately attempted to correct herself. But as far as her cellmate was concerned, that was just her trying to backtrack. And she was pretty sure that was the case as, the way she would later describe it, things became very awkward. Almost as if the killer knew she had just sealed her fate and wanted nothing more than to rewind time by a few minutes. But even in the light of all the evidence against her, Nancy remained steadfast in her innocence, so much so that when her trial finally began on April 5th of 2022, she pleaded not guilty. 
She had tried to get out on bail during the months prior when she was still locked up with a specific reason her lawyers gave for being allowed to get out in April of 2020, being that her age and diabetes put her at particularly higher risk during the pandemic. Unfortunately for her, though, her attempts to escape being locked up were rejected, and that meant she would spend the next few years behind bars, waiting for her trial to begin. By the spring of 2022, it was up to both sides to present their arguments about what the truth of the matter was in the courtroom, with each hoping the jury would believe their side. For the prosecution, the motive for the crime was simple. It was the one and a half million dollars she was going to receive from her husband's various life insurance policies. As they laid it out, she had been unsatisfied with her financial situation for some time prior to the murder. And because she didn't see any hope of that changing as long as Daniel was alive, she decided to take drastic action in order to change her circumstances for the better. In the words of the lead prosecutor on the case, quote, Daniel Brophy was worth almost one and a half million dollars to Nancy Brophy if he was dead and he was worth a life of financial hardship if he stayed alive. Nancy Brophy planned and carried out what she believed was the perfect murder a murder that she believed would free her from the grips of financial despair. The defense, however, would reject that claim outright. The way they presented things instead, all of the evidence against their client was circumstantial at best and didn't actually prove she had done anything wrong. On top of that, Nancy was madly in love with her husband and so had no reason to hurt him in any way something which was backed up by her niece when she took the stand to describe having personally witnessed her aunt grieving, crying, sobbing, and breaking down many times following Daniel's death. Nancy would reassert all of that herself when she eventually took the stand too, with her describing the pain she felt upon losing her husband by telling the jury, quote, It's like you've lost an arm. Like you're just not as good as you were when you're with him. You were the best you could be when you were together with him. Now it's like, yeah, I function, but there's something missing. Yes, she and Daniel had undergone some financial issues, something she freely admitted. Of course, that wasn't a motive for her to murder him, she argued. No, they were dealing with things by making plans to downsize to a smaller home. And when it came to his life insurance policies, well, that was just a standard thing he'd taken out in case the worst ever happened. It was something most people did once they reached a certain age, in fact. What about the gun she'd been looking up online, though? Surely that was a damning piece of evidence against the woman accused of fatally shooting her husband. Well, to her, there was a perfectly reasonable explanation for that as well. And that reason was she was researching a future novel of hers, one in which the use of ghost guns would be a crucial plot point. I read an article about a guy in California who bought a gun online, put it together, and killed his family. And I am amazed by this. I'm amazed it's you're able to do this. But I'm sitting there thinking, you know, what if it was a woman who was afraid? What if it was a woman who bought the gun online or bought gun pieces online and put them together to protect herself? And so once I kind of flipped the story in my mind, uh, I started building it. Now, the cool thing about the article, and there were other articles that followed it, was that it had links in it. And the links took me to various sites that showed me what was available. One was to ghostguns.com, and one was to Ghost Gunner, something. It was, had a, there was another similar title to it. Okay. Did you go there? After reading that article, did you go there? I did. Before you read that article, did you did you know that guns could come in kits? No. So as you're thinking about this story in the beginning, how did you imagine it would come together? I, what I really thought is when I was thinking about it was that you would buy pieces one place or another. Maybe gun shows, uh, gun shops had them. Maybe gun show people. Maybe you bought them online. But I was thinking there's got to be these pieces available where you could put a gun together. And then, lo and behold, there are kits. You don't have to go and shop everywhere. Okay. You just The story that you had, right? how did the gun parts fit into the story arc? Well, that gets to be really important. The way I was going to write the story was each month a piece would come to her in the mail and she would, so that would be the beginning. And as the gun built, so did the story arc. And 
so did her character arc and what did you learn from putting a gun together and what did, how did it compare to your life? How does that, how does that solve some of your problems as you're working through them? So it was piece by piece, chapter by chapter. That's how. She was apparently so dedicated to that research that she even purchased a Glock 17 to get a feel for what it was like in reality before she wrote about any characters who used one. As she told the court, quote, what I can tell you is it was for writing. It was not as you would believe to murder my husband. Nancy also gave another reason for why she wanted to purchase a gun. She claimed that it was so Daniel could carry it with him when he went out mushroom hunting. She said that mushroom hunters could be territorial and that he had told her that he had heard hunters in the distance while he was out in the woods. Now, if she wanted him to have personal protection from someone else while out by himself, that makes sense. But she mentioned that she was afraid that he could accidentally get shot by people out hunting in the area. How would having a gun with him help that? It didn't 100% add up. Nancy was also known to be fairly liberal and did not like guns. I don't want to get too far into your politics, but is it fair to say that they are somewhat left of center? I think that would be fair, yes. Okay. And for many years, would you have to told people that you are anti-gun? I would have. My first husband was a police officer, uh, and uh, uh, he had a gun collection. And we negotiated when we were married that he, in fact, would not have the gun collection in the house. I felt that strongly. She went on to claim that she had become less against guns over the years because of all the shootings that had been happening over the last decade. But it seemed as if Daniel didn't feel the same way. In her own words, she described that Daniel refused to carry the gun with him anyway. I'm the type of person who is very interested in human behavior, and I believe I have a good ability to read people. I try to tell the stories in these videos based on facts, the evidence that was presented or the statements that were said by people involved in the case. In most of these videos, though, I will give my personal opinion of the behavior of the monster in the story, usually when there is interrogation or court footage included in the video like this one. Now, I'm not an expert, but I believe I have the ability to notice human behavior that stands out. In Nancy's testimony, she spends a lot of time over-explaining everything. That's something that's considered a common trait of people who are lying. They want to answer questions before they even get asked, so they offer up more information than they would need to in order to just answer the question. It's a method of controlling the conversation. For Nancy, she's asked where Daniel worked, and she would go into detail about where he worked and when he started working there and how much his students liked him and what his goals for working there were. I'm listening to some of her testimony as I type this, and when she's asked about Daniel's love of gardening, she explains how he would go to Starbucks and get used coffee grounds, and he did what's called lasagna gardening, where he layered the soil and what kind of radishes she likes. It's way too much information. Other times, she would just inject information that was completely unnecessary. The police come, this police woman and a couple other people come, and they get me, and we walk half a building and they're saying stand over here so you're out of the light of the media and I said okay and I'm crying and a police woman who, who if you asked me later I would have told you it was 100 pounds but it turns out she wasn't uh, reaches out and hugs me and that's the exact moment when I knew while explaining what happened after she showed up at the school, she not only explains that she thought the officer was 100 pounds, she points out that she wasn't. In the middle of crying about finding out her husband is dead, that's what she feels she needs to explain. It just seems off. The rest of her testimony was her explaining how she wouldn't have wanted Daniel dead because her life was so much harder without him. Of course, the defense had to try to get out ahead of the other piece of damning evidence against her. Did you learn that the police had video, or were you told that the police had video of you driving in Beaverton? Yes. Did that surprise you? No, I could believe that. Okay. Did they tell you that they had video of you near the murder scene? Yes. <laughs> did, did, that, did you believe that was true? Not for one second. I thought, they're making this up. This isn't true. 
So shortly after your arrest, did you, uh, were you represented by a lawyer named Katie Dunn? I was. And at some point, did Ms. Dunn come to show you some of the evidence in the case? She did. And did she show you a photograph that kind of shook you to your core? She showed me a photograph of what looked like my van and what looked like me in it. And what looked like me in clothes I recognized. Which what do you mean clothes you recognize? That night shirt that we've talked about, the nubbly black one with the uh, white lace um, applique. Uh, and I was obviously somewhere near the school. I can't remember if the backdrop was, uh, was Bellagio's or uh, whatever. I wasn't that involved with the backdrop, but I can tell you it looked like me. I can tell you that I was, uh, oh man, I was frightened to death. You know, I was, if I'm, you know what they say? They say old age isn't for sissies. So what happens is I turn 65 as I'm starting to lose my eyesight. Then I'm starting to lose my hearing. I'm looking at this and thinking, oh man, I'm now losing my mind because that's what you think, you think, how can this have happened and me not remember this? How am I sitting here in a vehicle and have absolutely no memory of how I got there? And they're saying it happened at this time and it's video stamped. It's not like it's, you know, trust us, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's this time. It was not that. It was this picture and I'm sitting there thinking, I, I, I'm not even sure what I was thinking, to be perfectly honest, because even now, as I think about it, my mind kind of goes blank with the horror of it, you know? Of course, at first, Nancy had told authorities that she was home all morning, showering and walking her dog. When they found the surveillance video of her driving, her story changed that she had just run out to pick up coffee. Something that seemed hard to forget, but she had just found out her husband had been killed, so we'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Then, not only did they find no charge anywhere for her having bought coffee, they found surveillance of Nancy near the culinary school, nowhere near her house or the local Starbucks. Then there was surveillance of her sitting in her van at a park near the culinary school. Later, after Ms. Dunn had shown you this photograph, Yes? Uh, did you watch videotape surveillance of the footage taken near OCI? Yes. Did any of that video spark any memory of what you might have been doing on June 2nd? Yes. Uh, uh, on I, So I am seeing myself sitting at this park writing. Uh, and the reason why this sticks out is the, it was a parking lot and it was empty, but there was a white van there. And there was some guy who kept walking back and forth, walking back and forth, walking back and forth. And I think he was working on the van, but it was just enough to throw me out of, of where I was that I moved. I said, no, I can't pay attention to him and think about what I need to think about. And so I moved the car. So in, in this memory. Yes. Um, is it a real memory? I mean, this is a real memory, right? Yes. Um, what are you doing when you're in the car? I have a pad of paper. I'm jotting things down. And uh, uh, it's a pleasant day. I can remember that because it wasn't raining. Uh, and it's shady. It's, you know, I, I'm just sitting here pulling it together. But uh, but that's when I, that's what I can remember is that it would be a place I would have found, felt very comfortable writing. And so I'm sure that that is a true memory. Now her story is that she had driven down to this specific neighborhood by OCI because it was somewhere she felt comfortable writing. Now, people forget stuff all the time. And like she explains in her previous clip, she's getting older, so it might happen more often. The problem is that she told one story, and then her story gradually changed to match what evidence investigators had found. She told the investigators that she was home all morning, and when they found proof of her driving somewhere, she didn't say, oh right, I went to this neighborhood to write. It wasn't until her story was disproven again that she suddenly remembered that she had done something that would explain that evidence. 
and when her lawyer asks her about it, she goes into detail about how she's having trouble remembering things as she gets older. That, despite having spent more than a day on the stand remembering every detail about her life up until Daniel was killed. While she may not have sounded convincing to many in the courtroom, at least there was one piece of good luck for Nancy in terms of the way she was presented to the jury as before the trial had begun. The judge had ruled that her self-published essay, How to Murder Your Husband, would not be able to be used as evidence. And the reason he gave for that was that any minimal value it may have had in determining whether or not she was guilty was substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice it could create amongst the jury. In a court of law, evidence has to have what's called probative value. That means it proves something about the case. Sometimes, evidence might have a little probative value, but it's also prejudicial, and the judge can rule that the evidence is more prejudicial than probative and will not allow that evidence to be used at trial. Now, I'm not saying that the judge's decision in this case is right or wrong. I'm just explaining the way the process works. Even without that piece of evidence, though, the prosecution had a number of other details that showed that Nancy was guilty of the murder of her husband, and a lot of that had to do with the information she withheld from investigators. She told them about a single insurance policy with a $40,000 payout, and not the rest that added up to over a million. So you did all your research of all these guns on one computer, then packed that away and put it in a box in the closet, and then you got a new computer, is that right? I get a new computer every year. I take a computer with me when I go out to the fields, I beat a computer up. I buy a fairly inexpensive computer because I know I'm replacing it the next year. Okay. And you thought the police would want that, but you didn't give it to them. Nancy claimed that she buys a new computer every year. That was why she packed up the computer she had done all of her gun research on and put it in storage. Like most cases that rely on a lot of circumstantial evidence, it was just another coincidence in a long line of coincidences. Just like the slide and barrel that coincidentally disappeared. Is it true that you did not tell the police about the slide and barrel? It is true. I did not tell the police about the slide and barrel. The slide and barrel that fit, would fit perfectly on the gun show gun that you purchased. The slide and barrel that I was using for research for my writing, I did not tell them about that. You can answer that question? I did. I said I did not tell them. Would you agree that it fit on the gun that well, you bought from the gun? It was the same thing. It could have been interchanged, yes. Those gun parts had disappeared and Nancy had coincidentally never mentioned them to authorities. And the question of why she even purchased another slide and barrel for the Glock 17 that she had gotten at the gun show was brought up. She claimed that she wanted to take the slide and barrel apart as research for her book, but she didn't want to take the Glock 17 apart. Except she had already testified that she had taken the slide and barrel off of the Glock 17. Why did she need to buy another slide and barrel that perfectly fit the Glock 17? It was because she wanted to use it to shoot her husband and then dispose of it. Hence, why the new slide and barrel were now missing. The biggest problem I have with Nancy's story is that she originally claimed to have been home and then constantly changed her story when new evidence was discovered. You would agree that you're driving around and at the, in front of the culinary institute at the exact time that Dan is being murdered? I, no, actually I don't agree with that. I was driving around for a full hour before Dan got murdered. I was down there before Dan ever got to school. I was driving around riding for a full hour. I was only in that vicinity for six minutes, and I don't know that Dan was uh, murdered in that six minutes. Uh, you know, we agree that he we agree that he was murdered in that time frame, but in terms of when he arrived and shortly thereafter. But in whether it was not in that six minutes or not, I don't know. I'm sorry. Did you just say that you were driving around riding? Yes. That's what I was doing, was driving around riding. I, I testified to that yesterday, that I would find a place to park and I'd jot down ideas. I thought you didn't know that you were driving. So if you do not know, you uh -huh. have no memory of driving around downtown on the morning of June 2nd, uh -huh. how can you sit here today and say that I was driving around riding? Because if I was down there, that's what I was doing. And you're right, I stand corrected that I should have answered the question differently and said I don't know. But I do know, based upon the timestamps, that I was down there an hour before Dan died. 
and that I was only down there for six minutes or less from the time that he signed into the building right. until you see me again leaving the area. Right. That six minutes, mm -hmm. you just happened to be in front of the Culinary Institute during that time. No, I wasn't. Did you see the video where you can see your van turning off of 17th onto Jefferson at 7.28 a.m.? I, I did see that, but that doesn't mean I was in front of the, the Culinary Institute. That means I would have come up from another street to have gotten there. But you're not seen on any other cameras until that moment. Ah, uh, but as you all testified, if there's a train, you can't see when people cross Madison. So I could have been, and what I actually think I was, if this is having thought about it for a while, is in another parking lot off Madison at that point. So I can say at 728, I definitely turned the van and was driving uh, there, and we all saw it, but I have no idea. And I know I wasn't parked in front of the building, so what I would have been is riding someplace else and coming around. Now, I'm doing this based upon putting stuff back together, not based upon actual memory. She says herself in that clip that she's not basing her information on memory, but she's adamant that she knew where she was. She claims to not remember exactly where she was when Daniel got shot, but she's positive that she wasn't in front of the school. And on top of that, her story is that she was driving around for over an hour, just driving and writing. Then she coincidentally got home in time to be called by authorities about Daniel's murder and has absolutely no recollection of having just been driving around for over an hour. It just doesn't add up. And that seemed to be the opinion of the jury, because after a seven-week-long trial saw every potential theory and avenue be discussed and dissected, the jury ultimately determined that she was guilty of murder in the second degree on Wednesday, June 8, 2022. Obviously, that would leave the family and friends of Daniel, most of whom had by that point come to accept that his wife was guilty of killing him, very happy as at the very least justice was going to be served. As Daniel's mother Karen put it, once the verdict had been handed down, quote, I'm just very, very thankful that everything has turned out the way it has. It's been a long three and a half years. And she wasn't the only one who made it clear publicly that she felt the right decision had been reached as Nathaniel Stillwater, Daniel's son from a prior marriage, also spoke to the press where he stated, quote, We've all been waiting three and a half, almost four years now to start grieving this loss. To finally have some closure has been very important and meaningful for our family, and we feel that we can start to move on and remember my father always, but begin that process of starting to grieve. Nancy Crampton Brophy received a life in prison with no possibility of parole for at least 25 years. That meant that there was not much hope of her seeing the outside world again. Given the fact that she was 71 years old at that point, there was a high likelihood that she would die behind bars. That remains the case today as she continues her sentence, all with the full knowledge that she'll probably never get out. Does she regret any of her actions? That's hard to determine as she's chosen not to make any kind of public statement following her sentence. One thing we do know, however, is that, even if she has no interest in discussing her husband, his students have been more than willing to keep his memory alive. So dedicated are they to that endeavor that they even held a tribute dinner for their former teacher on August 27, 2022, with all the proceeds of ticket sales for that going to his son Nathaniel as he was struggling financially with legal fees related to a separate civil suit he'd filed against Nancy. But getting to go to a dinner where students of the man made a five-course meal based on his own recipes wasn't the only way people could remember Daniel Brophy following his death. They could also watch one of two TV specials dedicated to the case, with the first being an episode of the A&E series Taking the Stand, and the second being a Lifetime movie named How to Murder Your Husband, The Nancy Brophy Story, where the couple were played by Steve Gutenberg and Sybil Shepard. It was during a press tour for that movie that Gutenberg even offered his insight into what had happened between the two, with him arguing that Daniel was far too optimistic of a person to ever notice any of the warning signs that his wife was planning to kill him. He said, quote, I think that he was in love with this woman and he wanted his marriage to work. I actually think he was an optimistic person, which there are in this world and we need more of them. 
Even at this point, years after his death, people who never personally met Daniel have been able to hone in on what it was that made him so special to those close to him. And despite him now being gone, it appears that attitude of optimism, dedication to his craft, and always trying to see the best in the world around him have spread to his family and friends. Meaning he'll live on long after his wife, the monster who killed him, has passed away in prison. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.